Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of r slash entitled parents. My name is Ryan, the official host here on Reddit Voice, and I look forward to bringing you guys today's top stories. Before I do though, I'd really appreciate it if you made sure you were subscribed with notifications turned on, that way you could stay up to date with all the latest and the greatest. Entitled Mother became enraged because our food program was cancelled. That food program was the charity of a teacher who passed away. Context. This woman had been a problem parent at the center for as long as her five-year-old child, Molly, had been there. The girl started as an infant in our baby room, so that's five years of this woman. This EM is not a good person. She wouldn't pack lunches for her daughter. She'd often send her then 13-year-old daughter to bring Molly into the daycare because she didn't want to, and at least three times a week, teachers had to give the child a bath in the sink. And when she was too big for that, a sponge bath because she smelt so bad. Yes, we did call CPS and I'm not sure what came of it, but I know that Molly is still in her custody. It was awful, but there was one saving grace that this girl could look to. Jenny. Jenny was the sweetest woman you'd ever meet. She worked in one of the preschool classrooms, but her heart was so big and open that she extended her kindness to all children. Every time Molly came in without a lunch, Jenny would make sure she had food, even if it meant driving to the local Walmart or country fair to get her a sandwich. Eventually, Jenny began to bring in food personally for Molly, because Molly's entitled mother would never pack her lunch. Jenny died suddenly and unexpectedly in 2019. She was young, just barely over 30, and EM kept bringing Molly in without lunches. Up until COVID hit, it was an ongoing battle that finally came to a hit yesterday. Molly came in at 10.30 yesterday, which was too late for breakfast. In the preschool classrooms, we keep them on a schedule, and breakfast ends at 8.30, while they get a snack at 10 o'clock. Molly had a snack, and lunch started at noon. When the teacher opened her lunchbox to prep her food at lunch, she noticed that there was breakfast in there. She decided politely to remind Molly's mother that breakfast ends at 8.30, and if she was planning to bring her in later, to please have her eat before she comes in. Because things are already in full swing in the classrooms, this was done via a childcare app that we use to communicate with the parents, well, EM did not like that, and called the center screaming at our assistant director. This lasted for 10 minutes, and the pregnant AD came into my room, the infant room, angry about all of this. She cooled down and went back to her office, the offices being right next to my room, so I was somewhat nosy and listening in. EM came to pick up Molly, effectively pulling her from the center. There, she got to shouting at the AD. Wouldn't you be upset if they weren't feeding your baby? Wouldn't you want justice and people held accountable? That's when the director stepped in and told AD to check on the other classrooms. Translation, you don't have to listen to this, I'll handle it. D then followed up with, Personally, I would make sure that my child ate breakfast before bringing her in. AD left at that point. EM was throwing a fit about how she didn't like the teachers there, how she thought Tiana, the preschool teacher for the four to five year olds, was a raging bitch, and how she didn't like her since the beginning, and how a lot of parents pulled their kids because of her. Thing is, she was confusing Tiana with Tessa, the younger preschool teacher for the three to four year olds. Tessa is admittedly a strict woman, but her strictness was countered with kindness and positive reinforcement. EM is so out of touch with her daughter's providers that she never even got to meet Tiana. Finally, she delivered the zinger everyone knew was coming, but hoped she had enough class to refrain from saying. You stop doing the food program when Jenny died. I think you're just too selfish and cheap to honor her memory and continuing it. To which D finally stood up and said, Jenny was the food program. She bought that food for Molly out of her own pocket, with her money, that she earned caring for the children here. The reason this so-called food program stopped was because Jenny died. To which EM doubled down and said, Well, why wouldn't you just continue to buy food for the children in her honor? Because we do not have the budget to allocate funds for a food program. And in addition, in our handbook, it states we are only to provide snacks. We would need a whole other set of clearances and regulations to start serving food here like a cafeteria. But you did it when Jenny was here. This argument continued back and forth like that until finally, D basically said that that was the second outburst that EM had and that they could no longer accept Molly at the center with this continued behavior. EM, needing to get the last words in, finished with, Fine, 
I don't want to send my child to a place that starves her anyway. Then she left with Molly. My heart breaks for the child, but there's not much else to do. I just can't believe how classless you have to be in one argument to bring up a beloved saintly person like Jenny and then basically insinuate that our wonderful AD was going to be a bad mother while acting like we are still somehow the a-holes for canceling our non-existent food program. Edit. Wanted to say a few things because apparently I wasn't clear enough. First, Molly had both breakfast and lunch in her lunchbox. Tiana assumed she ate breakfast at home since she came in at 10 o'clock, so didn't know there was breakfast in her lunchbox. Molly had and ate lunch that day. Breakfast was sent home. Second, CPS was called when Molly was an infant and she was two or three. I can't remember exactly as I didn't make the call. Both times, nothing came of it. However, Molly was clean coming in and her mother is begrudgingly packing her lunches. Third, a lot are wanting me to contact CPS a third time. I personally do not have the information available to make a proper report. Full name, address, legal guardian, updated phone number, things like that. I can, however, talk to Tiana, whom was her teacher. I know Tiana was considering calling CPS again, but she didn't disclose the reason to me. Tiana has a lot more information and insight on this situation than me. I teach in an entirely separate classroom and only got this story because it was so public. And of course, considering she was yelling at the pregnant AD who wouldn't want to know why. Oops, just realized AD is a pregnant woman and not a man who speaks like this. Oh well, edit two. AD ended up calling the police because EM was blowing up our messaging app for our daycare, calling Tiana all sorts of horrible names and talking crazy. Some threats were made towards the AD, so Tiana told her and the AD is considering filing a restraining order if things continue to escalate. She threatened to dox the center, as our center's contact info's online, so I don't know if that's a dox, but that's what she basically threatened to do. CPS was contacted, this woman has a record, and I'm pretty sure half the threat she made could get her in a lot of trouble. A metric duck ton happened this weekend. I cannot even. This might be the last edit. I'm not comfortable sharing much more because this is escalating way, way too quickly and I want to make sure that things are in control before I update again. Alright guys, I just spent the last 10 minutes looking through this person's profile and unfortunately it looks like this is where our story comes to a close. Hopefully things will end up okay for the kid in the future, but you know, life is strange. I'm pretty sure we could all say we grew up with at least a little trauma, and you know, sometimes that trauma makes us into who we are, so I wish Molly the best in her future endeavors. Try not to be like your mom, Molly. My son can't be injured. He's supposed to win the football game. My father is so narcissistic and entitled that I could fill a whole book on stories about him. He based just about every aspect of his parenting on traditional masculinity. The good, and more often than not, the bad. He tried to mold me into as many traditionally male roles as he could, hoping that something would stick. One of his attempts was to try and get me into American football. Now I can give my dad credit for trying to at least get me into some sort of extracurricular activity, but the way he went about it made it seem like it was more for his sake than it was for mine. My dad enrolled me into a youth football summer camp when I was around eight, the age minimum at the time. I was a little intimidated at first and didn't like being pushed around by the other kids. However, the coaches were encouraging and helped guide me through it all so I wouldn't be so afraid of being tackled. My dad came to watch whenever he could and quickly established his role as the soccer dad, or in this case, football dad, who'd scream and yell at everyone, including their own kid, if the game wasn't going in their favor. That wasn't no foul, you son of a bitch. That kid can't kick for crap. My ex-wife makes better calls than that. Sometimes you see something written in all caps and you just have to take advantage. There were more than a few times where the coaches or someone working for the camp had to calm down my dad when he got too riled up. My dad had me take football after school and in another year of summer camp. Throughout that time, I had gotten good at football, but I just didn't enjoy it. It was large in part due to my dad rubbing it in so much, but it was also because I just didn't like being so aggressive with the other kids. I was a strong kid, but I didn't like being aggressive unless I felt like I was in danger. I mostly wanted to do more mild-mannered activities like reading books or playing board games. I'm currently studying literature in a community college. 
To my dad, the idea of a little boy not being physically aggressive and a loose cannon was seeming like an alien from another planet. So despite my protests, he had me continue playing until one day I couldn't. The following summer, I was in the middle of a lively game when about three-fourths of the way in, I fell and my foot was killing me. I tried getting up, but my foot hurt like crazy whenever I tried to walk on it. I tried going to the bench toward the coach, and my dad followed me down. Oh, Pete, what are you doing? You're about to win. Dad, I think I twisted my ankle. Nonsense. You can't twist an ankle. It's not like your foot can just go backwards. Walk it off. Dad, it really hurts. Sir, we can take a look at your son's foot if you're concerned about his injury. Ha ha ha, don't listen to him. He's just trying to get out of it. Get back out there and finish this game. But dad... No buts, except yours getting back out on the field. Go, go, go. Too tired and pain to protest, I went back out on the field, trying to keep my weight off my hurt foot. Before long, I fell on that same foot, and this time the pain shot from a zero to a hundred in a nanosecond. I was on the field crying and clutching onto my foot while the coach called a timeout. I was taken aside and gasped in horror when they took off my shoe. My foot was bent to the left, the ankle side of it, completely red purple and looking like the bone was about to pierce through the skin. The coaches called an ambulance and I was taken to the hospital where I was treated for a broken ankle. The whole time my dad kept saying things like, how could this happen? Or you were so close basically blaming me for supposedly costing my team the win. I cried, both in pain from my ankle and from letting down my dad. Later, dad begrudgingly told me that the doctors said I can't play any more football for the rest of the summer, so he signed me out of the program and never signed me up for another one since. I suppose that was one silver lining in the whole fiasco, as I was never again forced to play a sport I hated, but my dad ended up exploiting the perks of having a temporarily handicapped son, and that's a story for another day. Moral of the story, just because you didn't fulfill your sports dream as a kid doesn't mean that your kid's obligated to fulfill it for you, especially if it risks their literal neck or ankle in my case. TLDR, Entitled Dad pushes me to play football and dismisses an ankle injury about it until it becomes serious enough to warrant hospitalization, rendering me unable to play football again. And now for our final story here on the video, a tale as old as Reddit itself. Not this particular tale per se, but this particular scenario. EM freaks out because her kid can't pet my dog. This happened several years ago, and to date is the most abrasive interaction I've ever had with other folks in public regarding my service dog, who is now retired. EM, Entitled Mom, EK, Entitled Kid, SD, Service Dog, and me, Self-Explanatory. I was maybe 21 at the time, and it was the beginning stages of really learning to be an adult on my own at the time. I had just moved out of my parents' house and to an apartment with a friend. Before this, I still lived at home with my parents and usually just went to school, work, and didn't often go places because I'm kind of a homebody. So between school, work, and the odd outing with my parents or friends, everyone usually around me was really respectful and familiar with my service dog and my general rules about her. I didn't have issues really, and if I did, someone less anxious and more assertive was usually there to help me. This was no longer the case after I had moved out. I was out and about running some errands on my own, which I was beginning to enjoy doing, with my service dog at my side. Along the way, I realized I hadn't eaten in a while and decided to stop at the food court to the mall I was in right then and there for something quick and tasty. I got my food, got a seat, and began to get my SD focused and prepared to go through our usual process so I could get started on my meal. I'm not secretive or anything personally, and usually I'm down to discuss my dog and educate if I have the time or energy with someone who's polite and well-meaning. I have a really intense food allergy, so that's what she's there for. She also knows how to bring me a handful of objects on command like an EpiPen, inhaler, or just lay down next to me to give me access to meds carried on her harness. It's really important that she not be disturbed while I have her check things because a missed alert can be life or death for me. Not to be dramatic or anything, but breathing tends to be important. So, I'm about to go through my process of having my dog do a check when I see a child making a beeline for my service dog. She's harnessed, clearly and boldly marked, and not facing this little girl. That doesn't matter though, because the child is clearly too young or excited to read. Puppy! 
I placed a hand out instinctively just in time to keep her from touching my dog, who's still set to do her check thankfully. I try to be understanding with kids, but I have a few hard and fast rules. I never reward attempts to touch without asking. I will stop and thank polite children though. Each situation usually gets a conversation from me about how important working dogs are. However, even with polite children, I do not stop my dog mid-task for my own safety. Oh no, honey, please don't touch the puppy. She has a really important job and she's working right now. This is usually good enough explanation for most children about two and up. Not this one though, because she immediately starts crying. We're talking full on pouring tears and a red face as she screams loudly in the busy food court. I looked around for a parent and locked eyes with a round blonde woman who was apparently staring icy daggers at me. Why are you touching my child? Puppy, I want the puppy. EM marches over to me from her table and demands that I let her child pet my dog. I could feel the heat on my neck because I was so embarrassed at all the staring faces. I'm sorry, I really can't do this. This is my service dog and she's working right now. If I let her get distracted during her task, I can get really sick or even worse. Service dogs are for disabled people. You obviously aren't blind and you don't look sick. Thanks. That means she's doing a good job. What's wrong with you then? Just let her pet the dog. The child's carrying on incoherently during this exchange and has now thrown herself on the floor. My service dog is not engaging her, but is fond of children, so she's looking at her with concern. I get more irritated because I will have to wait longer to eat now. Me? That's none of your business. Nobody's petting the dog. Can you please leave me alone? Your kid shouldn't be running at large dogs she doesn't know anyway. I bet you're just faking it. I don't think pit bulls can even be service dogs. Any breed can be a service dog, lady. Please go away and take your daughter with you. EM looks like I just slapped her in the face. She could tell I wasn't gonna budge. She picks up the small screaming child, walks back to her table, and puts her in a stroller. She gathers her stuff and finally leaves. I breathe a sigh of relief and decided to check my phone for a minute so my SD could forget the ordeal and reset. I figured it was behind me and I could go back to what I was doing. But oh how wrong I was. Just a few minutes later, I could hear the screech of an EM heading back into battle. The child was still crying and this time she was accompanied by a security officer. There! That animal bit my baby! My eyes probably looked like they were going to fall out of my head. I knew people had weird hangups about breeds, but this lady had just been demanding her kid be allowed to pet my dog. I couldn't believe it. This particular security guard looked like he didn't want to be mediating between adults at all. He asked me if it was true and I of course said it wasn't. I told him that the child had run up to my dog and the mother was mad that I wouldn't let my dog be pet. He asked if she was a service dog and I confirmed that she was. He asked if she was training to do a task to mitigate a disability and I indeed confirmed she was. She's lying. That mutt bit my daughter and made her cry. Puppy child is visibly reaching for the dog. The security guard is clearly having none of her crap at that point. My service dog is calmly sitting next to us during the whole ordeal, watching me. She doesn't look exactly vicious and was quite a sissy actually. At this point, a girl, nice girl, around my own age chimes in. This lady and her kid were bothering OP. That child was never bitten. You have cameras, right? The security guard confirms there are indeed cameras and says we'll all need to follow him so he can check the footage due to the severity of the accusation. Either I have to call animal control or the police. Harassing a service dog is a felony and a dog biting a child is a pretty big deal. Either way, someone's in trouble. EM looks panicked and starts to backpedal and says she's willing to drop it if everyone can go on their way. Her precious baby is fine after all. I'm not willing to drop it. You lied about me. Let's go. Then three more security guards show up and we all get escorted to the security office. Sure enough, the footage shows that Kid never even got within arm's reach of my dog and EM was harassing us. They then asked me if I wanted to press charges, to which I say I do. Police show up within a few minutes and I happen to know one of the officers because he's my ex-boyfriend's dad. We split amicably before we graduated high school. He knows me, he knows my dog. He loves my dog and said she's one of the best trained dogs he's ever met. I usually wouldn't be petty, but I excitedly greeted him. He smiles, asks if it's okay to pet the service dog at the moment. I thank him for asking permission and say of course. EM looked like she could just throw something. The other officer takes my statement. 
In the end, the officers see the footage, EM gets arrested, and extra charges are thrown in for resisting arrest and assaulting an officer. It was pretty wild and my first real experience with entitled people on my own. The charge for harassing my SD ended up getting dropped, but the other two charges stuck. I don't care too much about that, but hopefully she learned a lesson. I also did eventually get to eat. And there you have it, folks. The end of today's r slash entitled parents. If you liked the video, be sure to leave a like on the video as well as make sure you're subscribed with notifications turned on. That way you could stay up to date with all the latest and the greatest. As always, my name's Ryan, the official host here on Reddit Voice, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video.